Welcome to House of Faith and welcome to this Give Me Liberty Tour. We are absolutely blessed by you being here. And we think of you as the people who are going to make a change in this culture, a change in our nation. You may not realize how important you are. But God has a hold of you in such a manner that you can make a huge change. And we can get the traditional freedoms that America once had coming right back to you and me. And it's a privilege for us to have you here today. I want to just open in prayer before we move forward. So if you just close your eyes for a moment. So our Father in heaven, we come to you this day as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but also as a citizen, as citizens of this great land, the United States of America. And you have given us a government based upon your sacred truths, a government that has been instituted for us and which derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. And you desired for us to have a government whose core is that all men are created equal, and that from that equal creation they derive rights inherent and inalienable, among which are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And we thank you, Father, that you loved us enough, and you love the rest of the world enough that you had this nation founded and founded upon Judean Christian principles by which we can become a lighthouse unto the rest of the world, shining the light of Jesus Christ into all the dark areas of the world and bringing life and liberty and freedom to all men else all over the world of all, and all of all time. We thank you for that. We thank you for the privilege that you've granted unto us, a privilege to live in this great land. And tonight, tonight, this is a time when we face reality and face the fact that the enemy, the greatest enemy, is always the enemy within. And that power of evil works in the hearts of men and women who do not understand what they may lose if they do not take this land back and get it back on the right track. Right. And so, night, so, so now we dedicate this time to hearing the words of men who have experienced things that we need to know about and who will encourage us to become the people that you want us to be and will give you the praise. I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen. Actually, Jose was also born in Cuba. Oh, really? uh, he was reared in, in Puerto Rico. His family uh, came to the States and then um, went to Puerto Rico. And he was there for many years. Um, my family went directly to, to Miami and, uh, and I was reared there. You know, when uh, Pastor Jim asked us to speak, it was, you know, we've, I've, I'm 50 years old. I came when I was four years old from Cuba. It seems like ages ago. And he gave me the opportunity to reflect and to think back uh, when we came from Cuba. We came in the 60s during the, um, the Cuban exile um, refugee movement uh, right after the Bay of Pigs. And um, I remember getting on the airplane being four years old and my mother tells me this story, would tell me the story that they had to put you know, her, their, her hand over my mouth because you know, the government uh, officials and the military had weapons and they weren't thrilled that we were leaving the country. Uh, it had come at a great cost to my parents to be able to leave. And I was as giddy as could be saying, yay, we're out of here, yay, we're out of here. <laughs> so they're like, I hope we can get out of here. <laughs> so um, what, I want, what I remember is coming to this country and um, my uncle, Manolito, Manuel Fernandez, um, told me this story when he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma a few years back. I never knew this about him. He was the first one to leave Cuba, and I said he was our Moses, <laughs> because he sponsored the rest of us uh, to be able to leave Cuba. And he shared with us um, that they had found he had multiple myeloma, and they said to him it was the prisoner's disease. And he said, prisoner's disease? And then he remembered, because you know, we take for granted. You, time passes and you take for granted your freedom and the life that we live here in America. 
and he said that he told us, he went out and told us a story of how um, when he, in the 50s, when he was in Cuba, and probably in his 30s, I would imagine, Fidel Castro came to power, and, uh, and when it became clear that this was a communist dictator that had come to power, right, um, things began to change. And he was falsely accused of starting a work stoppage. He said he was not involved. He was not for the government. He knew he wanted out, but he was not involved. But he was falsely accused by someone who knew that his, his plans were to leave the country. And he was sharing with me how they were about to execute him. And my grandmother and my grandfather um, were outside waiting to see him, not knowing that their son was about to be executed. And he said, only by the grace of God, someone intervened and said, I know this man, I know this man would never do something like this, and by the grace of God, they let him go. And so quickly, he left the country. <laughs> quickly, he left the country. And through him, you know, the way it worked was that you had to be sponsored by someone. And he came, he knew perfect English, um, and so he started sponsoring different, uh, you know, his different brothers and sisters, and we all started coming to the United States. My dad was fluent in English. My grandfather, who was in his 70s, was fluent in English. I wish I would have known him more than I did because he died early on in the 70s after we were here, and I was just a little girl. My dad, after um, he died at 48, after having had about 11 heart attacks, oh, wow. I think it took a lot on him having to leave his country and um, having to have, start over, start, you know, start over in a new country. But I will tell you that the one thing I remember of my childhood, having a wonderful heritage from my dad and my uncles, they got together every Sunday. It was family day. Every Sunday we went to somebody's house and the topic of conversation was God, strong believers, and Cuba, <laughs> and um, and how we were going back. <laughs> as soon as he, you know, he gets out of power, we are going back, and we, we are so thankful to this country. We have not come here to be a burden. My dad worked two and three jobs, uh, having been a professional in Cuba. I can't, you know, now as an adult, I think, well, having been an accountant, uh, I believe he worked for Shell Oil, and he was, you know, his life was set with his wife, and they had their home. And to have all of that taken away because you're not going to bow down to this uh, dictator. I have an aunt that lives in Miami who tells the story. She's a, a nun in the Catholic Church. Tells the story when they closed down the churches. And at gunpoint, they told her and the priests and everybody that they had to leave. They closed down the churches and they put up pictures of Fidel. And as you said, the dictator became the God. He was to be worshipped and not, and not the Lord and not God. And uh, so I came here at a very young age and I just remember the biggest part was the pride that my parents had in being able to live in America. And I felt the same way. Even as a little kid, I would walk around and say, they have no clue what they have. And they, that the other kids had no clue what they had. And I will tell you, as I look at America, as Jose and I look at America and we see gun control, it is very scary to somebody who's come from Cuba. Gun control is very scary because that's exactly what happened in Cuba. They took away all of the guns. And that's why Cuba is still under communist rule because there's no one that can put up a rebellion with what? <laughs> Your fists? They're, 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 so gun control is very scary. You know? And um, so as I see America and the things that are happening with America, it's bringing back memories of we've been down this road, we've lived through this, and uh, it is very scary. But the Bible says, if my people <laughs> called by my name, right, will bow down and pray, and I agree. <laughs> You know, we, I am very, very upset every time I read something new, something new, and I see the progress. But we cannot get discouraged. We need to bow down and pray and say, Lord, you are in control. You are in control of our president. And I agree. I pray for him. I say, Lord, change that man's heart. Change that man's heart. Change the thinking here in America. Wake up. <laughs> Wake up, America, because America is asleep. 
And I'm afraid that we're going to wake up after the freedoms are gone. And, uh, and, and you know, to, to have come here to be free, to have freedom, the freedom to worship. And, and, and I agree, my, my parents got to work. As soon as they got here, they got to work. And they instilled in us a work ethic that of being a hard working people, you know, and, and education was big and they were so thrilled to be in America. Jose and I became citizens after we got married. We were naturalized together um, at an event and we had to prepare. Uh, having grown up, you know, we, we could pass that test without any problems. <laughs> we helped other, people, other family members study for the test. But uh, there was great pride in being American citizens. Yes. And so I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to step back and go, Ampy, remember where you came from. <laughs> and, and the struggles and, um, and the sacrifice that my, that my parents made. You know, as I see these children coming now, uh, my heart is, is I mean, we love kids. We have a youth ranch. The Lord has given us the, um, the blessing to run and to open. And I love children. I said, but Lord, I know my parents would never have just sent me. We were all going, or no one was going. You know, that, that was, we are all leaving, and for us to be able to leave, it came at great cost. And I'll let Jose uh, speak to you about that. Of um, what, I think I turned it off with my head. Um, of the price his parents paid to be able to come. So not too big of a deal. 
until they took my dad away. And then he disappeared. For a year, we had no idea where he was. So as part of his service to the country, as part of his gift to the country to let us leave, he, he disappeared for a year into a concentration camp where he had to cut sugar cane for the communist country uh, for a year. And uh, he would tell me about these horrible condi conditions he had to live in and leeches all over and, uh, um, and, and how they developed these different things to get him off with cigarettes and burning the, the, themselves and, and just the food that they ate with worms and things like that. Uh, so a year later, this, this shadow of a man shows up at our doors and uh, that was my dad. He, uh, he had lost a tremendous amount of weight and uh, a skeleton, just, I mean, just a skeleton guy walking in with my uncle behind and uh, in his car and we just piled into the car and drove out to the airport and got on the plane and took off. Yeah. That was it. It's interesting, right now we're, <clears throat> the Lord has given us this ministry to, uh, to minister to abused kids and uh, we're getting ready to go through relicensing and so the state says you gotta take so much type of training, this type of training. One type of training that they said you have to take is called trauma informed care. So if you're taking care of a child, you have to be aware of the trauma the child has gone through in order to be able to treat him well. And I'm reading through all this material, and I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And then we get the cultural trauma. Wow, it just brought me back. That's where I went through. I never realized that. You know, when you have to leave your country, leave your, leave your possessions, leave your friends, your family behind, just take off, go to a new country. Nobody knows the language. How are you going to live? How are you going to feed yourself? Where are you going to live? What are you going to Nothing. It was just, imagine waking up one day and say, okay, I'm going to the Congo. Do you know anybody there? No. Oh, do you know the language? No. But that's where you're going, period. Oh, wow. Now you start living. You know, praise God we went to America because this is the land of opportunity. Yes. Blessed by God's hands. Yes. Because only in this country can this family come that doesn't know the language, doesn't have a job, has a couple of relatives here and there, and can pick up themselves, get a job, get themselves back on, the, on, their, on, the, on their feet, and become successful to the point where all of, well, two, two of us, by choice, <laughs> two of us went to college, and the other two decided not to. But we had the opportunity to go to college. We had the opportunity to, to learn, to grow, to, to, to dream, and make those dreams come true. Um, that's, that's the benefit of, of being in this country. So many of our countrymen, the Cubans, are still trying to come. And uh, at, at one point it was easy, quote unquote. If you made it to territorial waters of the US, you were granted asylum. And uh, too many were dying in the process because there's no, no, no vessel. So they would build their own rafts. They would take some wood. They would take down, and you can't take it from the outside. You can't go out to the lumber yard because then the government knows what you're doing. So they would take it from the inside of the house. They would take off the panels and everything and construct this raft in secret and figure out how to create some buoyancy devices in secret. In the middle of the night, you just go out to the beach and you just set off. Families would set off. And families would never make it because they didn't have any propulsion. So you just rely on either you know, just the rowing or, or the tide to take you there. Now imagine, I don't know if you've ever been in a cruise, we like cruising. And uh, if, you're, if you find yourself out in the cruise ship or, or you're out in the boat in the middle of the night and uh, where there's no street lights, no nothing, and you look past your hand, you cannot see a thing. Now imagine yourself in a little tiny raft where in a big cruise ship, we can feel the wave moving this huge boat. Now imagine yourself in that tiny little raft being moved by these six foot waves. Six up, six down, so you're moving 12 feet up and down. No way to propel yourself, so you're praying that you just got on the right stream, and you're praying that that trajectory will hit land eventually and not just take you out to sea forever. Many didn't make it. Many, we have a, a, a little piece of wood in our home that uh, it was made from one of these rafts that showed up, and that uh, you know somebody took it out and carved a nice image in there, but it's, it's, it's kind of a memento of all these people that have gotten so desperate to leave their home, their families, their everything behind, and seek of and, and seek and try to seek a, a better world for themselves. That's what this country represents: a better world, a world of opportunity, a world where God is still touching this land and blessing it with opportunities, with 
with with life, with liberty. It, it's just it's just amazing. There are so many things we take for granted, mm -hmm. and yet coming from those types of country, like like Abby was saying, when we start seeing oh gun control, we need to we don't own a we don't own a gun. We've never fired a gun. But I will be the first in line to protest gun control. Because this country gave us the right to bear arms. It's a right. And if it's a right, and it was developed by individuals that came out of that oppressive regime and developed the system that here's how people are gonna feel free and free. And you begin to see that happening and creeping into society. And then you see the, the media coming in alongside and, and reporting all these killings and all these gunshots and everything. It's like you know, look around the world. It's happening everywhere. It's not just the U.S. Gun control is not going to do anything. Heart control is going Amen. to do it. Amen. God control is going to do it. Bring God back into all the places that we've taken him out in this country. That's what's going to do it. It's just the books, the textbooks are being changed. You know, if you look at, at Christopher Columbus, all of a sudden he was... He was, a, he was a dictator. Christopher Columbus just he subjugated the, the Indians and this and that. And now Christopher Columbus has a horrible name. Yeah. Look at the current textbooks. Compare them to when you went to school. Right. He's no longer the, the discoverer of the world. Uh, and you begin to switch and turn history around. And generations that are coming up over time will think differently. The Bible commands us to raise the children the way they should go. Not just in, in the things of this world, but more importantly, in the things of God. So that's our responsibility, not the government's responsibility. We have to take that responsibility. And we unfortunately deal with so many children that have not been raised in that manner. And, and they're out of control. And they're having sex with children at 12 and 13 years of age. And they're doing drugs and they're trying to kill themselves on a regular basis. We just have one girl this yesterday that we have to hospitalize because she was... <coughs> She was trying to kill herself at 12 years old. It's, it's there. It's there. And we as a country, we as adults, we as Christians, have to take that name seriously and say, not in my watch. As for me and my house, yes. and my house is not just my wife and I. My house is my household, everybody yes. around me, everyone that I influence. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. No question. Amen. Thank you.